everyone, I'm Annika Chikin, and this is the Armenian Report. Welcome back for a new episode of the Armenian Report. But just in case, if you missed our previous episode with hip-hop artist Armin, be sure to go check it out. It's on Facebook and on YouTube. And it is, it's extremely important that I mention this. Please, please, please make sure that you leave a comment, you like, you share, but really, you leave a comment. The comments are extremely important. So if you like it, you don't like it, I hope you like it. Leave a comment if you like it. If you don't like it, don't leave a comment. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but really, please go check it out. And of course, don't forget to stay up to date with our daily posts on news stories related to Armenia and Armenians around the world in English. All of our content is being posted in Facebook stories and Instagram stories. I know many of you go on Instagram and you don't see that much content. That's because all of our content is in stories. So make sure you check out our stories in Facebook and Instagram. It's all in stories. Check it out every single day. You won't want to miss it. Per usual, I've got my cup of surch from Henry's House of Coffee. They are a huge supporter of the community. One dollar of every bag of Armenian coffee that you order from Henry's House of Coffee, they will donate to the Armenian Eye Care Project. So I encourage you to please go to Henry's House of Coffee and place your order of Armenian Surj, um, and you get five dollars off your first order with the promo code TAR, stands for The Armenian Report. So take a screenshot right now. And you can go place your order after you're done watching with the live show. And uh, I can't wait for you guys to try and support an Armenian company, support an Armenian um, project and the community. And enjoy Armenian coffee made by an Armenian. I'm ready to introduce our guest, Larissa Hovanissian. So I hope you've grabbed yourself a cup of surch, maybe a glass of wine. Hopefully it's Armenian guinea or some whiskey or perhaps Armenian brandy. Whatever your drink of choice is, grab your drink, join us, and be inspired during this talk. So let's welcome Teach for Armenia's creator and founder, Larissa Hovanissian. Hi, Larissa. Welcome to the Armenian Report. Thank you so much for doing this. Third time's a charm, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so, you. Me, just a really quick, brief background. So, Larissa and I did an introductory Skype call, and then we did our, our first live podcast interview where we recorded this and we're doing this again uh, because we had uh, major audio technical issues on our end. Thank you for uh, taking the time to do this again because like I said, I'm very inspired by your story and I really wanted to make sure that we shared it on the Armenian Report with the Armenian Report community. But before we get into you, because you and your team are the heart of Teach for Armenia, can you just briefly tell people who are watching right now what Teach for Armenia is in like two to three sentences, and then we'll do a deeper dive. Um, it's an educational nonprofit uh, founded uh, in Armenia about seven years ago that uh, has one purpose to end educational inequity in Armenia. And we do this by recruiting, training, and placing high achieving graduates from Armenia and from the Armenian diaspora to work as regular public school teachers in Armenia's most underserved public schools for a, a minimum commitment of two years. Thank you. Now, during your TED Talk in Yerevan, um, yes, TED Talk Yerevan, and Larissa spoke on there. It was, uh, you, everyone needs to go check it out. I'll put a little clip as well and the link for people to go watch it after they're done watching you live here. Um, during your talk, you... you you really honed in on the importance of developing your own story, how crucial it is to, for all of us to craft our own story. And you said that that began for you when you started Teach for Armenia. Its mission is to help our generation and our kids, our students, define their own narrative and their own story, even the last child in the very last village of Armenia, to help them find his or her own story. So I was gearing up to do a degree in, in business and, and um, I decided to take a detour and, and apply to this organization called Teach for America. I was selected and I ended up working in Arizona for two years as a special education teacher. 
Um, and that's when the story began for me. And it was, it was during those two years that I really kind of um, began to understand how important. Well, well um, tell everyone know, where in Arizona you are. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's our Armenian destiny. I ended up working in Glendale, Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> what are the chances? You you get yeah. placed in uh, Glendale, Arizona. I love that tabit. I, I wanted to make sure you mentioned that. Glendale, Arizona is um, mostly low a low income, underserved community, and I worked at a at a public school there. And I ended up teaching special education, so I taught kids with moderate to severe disabilities. And it was really during those two years that, you know, my That's life tough. priorities yeah. began to change inevitably. And I really started kind of thinking about what is it that I want to do with my life? How old were you and, at that uh, point when you're going through was, all this? I just graduated college. I was like 20, 21. 20, 20. Um, it was an investment in, in my kind of myself. How did the transition go from Teach for America to Teach for Armenia? Did Teach for Armenia exist? It, it was really my, my mother's kind of thinking that if, if I was doing something like this in the United States, you know, I could be doing something similar in Armenia and that, you know, Armenia needs teachers like Larissa to, you know, to work with kids there. And that's when the whole teach for Armenia idea began forming in my mind. There is, there was no teach for Armenia. Um, when I thought it up, I got in touch with teach for America and it kind of just like led me to packing up my entire life in the United States and, and moving over to, um, Armenia in early, uh, January, 2013. So your mom was in Armenia? Uh, by then my mom was already starting to make the move over to Armenia. So together with my sister. So, it was a really good time for me to consider kind of like moving back home in a way, although I actually never really lived in Armenia. I only spent my summers here, but it, it always felt like home. So you launched this under the old government and you're continuing to do this under the new government. You know, on the Armenian report, a lot of young Armenians are considering moving to Armenia, starting businesses in Armenia, uh, you know, spending half their time in Armenia and half here, or maybe hiring their team in Armenia. Um, so I'm hearing a lot of that buzz going on. And I think a lot of them would be really happy to hear from you. Someone who had the guts to go do this under the old government and is now thriving under the new government. What was that like? They want to hear this side of the story from you. Um, my answer to this kind of question is very simple. Um, I think education is human right, and no government uh, should violate that right that children have towards yeah. education and unfortunately today a lot of our kids like thousands of our children are are have are you know left out of the public education system and their rights their human rights violated you know to me when i when i moved here i knew that it would be challenging but it's challenging to launch a business anyway like no one has a real easy time doing that yeah. so my, my whole approach to any person I work with is I'm not doing this because I like you or because you need to like me back. Like we need to work together because we're doing this with kids. I think that that message and that stance has really enabled Teach for Armenia to be an apolitical organization, which we proudly are. And I believe it also kind of helps us withstand any political turmoil that happens and will continue to happen in this country because it shouldn't matter who the minister is or who the government is. Uh, we're doing important work and we're doing this not because we have political ambitions or mm -hmm. because we like one party and not the other, but because all parties need to care about our children. And that's the, and, and, and we are going to continue working with whoever is in power before today and whatever is to come later on. We recruit really uh, diverse fellows to do this program we have people that span the entire political spectrum we have you know people from armenia from the diaspora we have people from from the regions we have people of different you know kind of religious beliefs and and we think that that's really important because we need all people to really like a kind of 
feel, go through this experience and feel the educational inequity on their own skin. And then through their own angle later on, work to improve the system so that it's fair for our kids and we can actually propel our country towards greatness. And when you say prepare our kids, can you uh, briefly talk about what it's like for someone to join Teach for Armenia, what the process is like, and what does that mean to Teach for Armenia? It, we do a yearly recruitment process. Uh, basically, we look for people who at least have a bachelor's degree from a four-year kind of university we accept people with really different kind of professions and subject knowledge and so on and so forth we don't necessarily look for people who have an educational background or degree um, most of our people actually who get recruited don't come from a pedagogical university or a school of education we put people through um, a very rigorous recruitment process that starts with an application that has a phone interview we do a full day assessment center. If you're here in Armenia, it's an in-person assessment center. If you're in the diaspora, it's a it's a Skype kind of interview, but it it has a lot of different components in it. We do you know debates. We do uh, sample lesson plans. We do a subject knowledge test. We do critical thinking tests, so on and so forth. So by the time you you go through the entire recruitment and selection mm -hmm. pipeline, we end up recruiting at any given year, anywhere between 8 to 12% of our overall okay. applicants. Wow. So, for example, this year we had close to 700 applicants and we recruited um, 75 fellows. Wow. Um, and that's, and that's nice. by design. Like, we yeah. are a selective, competitive organization. In my year at Teach for America in 2010, when I was applying, there were 55,000 people who applied and many of them are from like Ivy League universities and really, really good institutions. And I think somewhere like around five and a half thousand people were selected. Wow. So, yeah. So, it, it, and it's because our organizations believe that our children deserve the best people who aren't just smart, but who really have the necessary val internal values to be good uh, teachers and role yeah. models for our kids. This is... This is no joke for all of you watching if you want to do this. This is seri like serious stuff. Like This isn't like, oh, let me just apply and see what happens. This is, this is the real deal. So once, they, once the, they, they're chosen, how is it a, maybe like a culture shock for them? Like, What are some examples of things that they have to go through that they otherwise wouldn't in, let's say, you know, Glendale, Arizona, perhaps, classroom? Yeah. So, I mean, once you get selected we give you an offer the next step is you go through an intensive summer training called the teacher leadership academy that is that in armenia places. or somewhere else it's in armenia it's okay. usually in one of our cool. regions where we work then we slate them to into uh, a, a rural community for the next two years so for their assignment and basically they make the move uh to a village that, that we assign to them yeah uh, sometime in August and in early September, they start their work as a, as a school teacher. What's a village they, like in Armenia? Um, it's, uh, it depends on the village, but overall, like the, the common kind of trend is that there is no indoor plumbing. There's no, no running water in the house. Usually, uh, the toilets are outside in your backyard. There's on and off electricity. Uh, not a lot of infrastructure in terms of like, you know, choice of housing and so on and so forth. So you kind of just end up living where you can find a, a, a space to live. And we have wonderful partnerships with our communities that, you know, and the principals and the parents help our, our mm -hmm. teacher leaders like find a, a place to stay. And given, um, and given tough, these, it's physically challenging. Yeah. It's it, so you, like you said, it's physically challenging, but given these challenges, what are the pros, regardless, that these uh, teachers are going to take from this experience when they walk away from, from uh, Teach for Armenia? Yeah, the earlier question you asked me, you know, what is the difference between someone teaching in Glendale, Arizona versus in Amarakits and mm -hmm. Village and Lori? I think, you know, yes, it's physically more strenuous in an Armenian village for the reasons that I just said. Um, but I think the love, and the kind of 
hospitality and the energy that the kids like show you throughout your time there um, is just, I mean, to me, it's not comparable. And I, I always tell our teacher leaders that yes, comparatively, you're going to be in a more physically d difficult kind of environment, but the amount of love and like um, warmth you're going to get from, from being in these communities is immense. And it is, it is going to actually change your life. And I feel like when people come into this, like they anticipated being a very important experience, but they don't quite necessarily know how much of an experience uh, of a fundamental experience it's going to be for them. And a lot of them think that they're going to do this for two years, but then they end up falling in love with their kids with the type of work that they're doing with education in general, that after the two years, a lot of them, over 70% of them stay in the education sector in some degree and capacity. And they continue to work towards our big goal of eliminating educational inequity in Armenia through different angles, which is ultimately the big idea behind this movement. We don't necessarily want our teacher, all of our teacher leaders to like stay as, as public school teachers. We, we want them to, you know, become the future principals of our schools, to become uh, content people, policy makers, ministry ministers of education regional governors you know we need desperately in armenia a generation of young people who are consciously aware of everything that's happening in this country and have felt it on their own skin you can in theory understand how difficult circumstances are in armenia but until you you know what it feels like to walk three kilometers to get water to you know have something to drink or to take a, a shower until you feel what that feels like on your own skin, you're never going to be able never. to make good decisions for the country. And we need leaders in this country who have felt that, who know how unfair it is and who desperately urgently want to change this as soon as possible for our kids. That was good. <laughs> that was really good. I was like, that's going to be my teaser right there. <laughs> um, <laughs> Marissa, can you share a story of someone who uh, went through the Teach for Armenia program and ended up staying and uh, maybe like living in Armenia or continuing the journey with Teach for Armenia? Do you have any like, uh, like fun or successful happy stories to share with us? We have many. It's hard to keep up. One, a few come to mind. One is um, we had a, a teacher leader, a program participant who joined us. Uh, from Beirut, she was born and raised there, Asha Lois, um, and she was placed to teach in the Davush region, right on the border with Azerbaijan. It was a very tough kind of environment to be in, and uh, she did it bravely. She taught in, yeah, she taught <sighs> English, uh, and she she was just and is like just the most like warm, energetic brilliant person and everyone fell in love with her in the village including this uh handsome young man oh, <laughs> <laughs> who she ended up falling in love with also oh my god and yeah and they recently got married and oh, uh, her family in came in from Beirut. yeah they got married in the village and her family oh. came in from beirut and they had a beautiful wedding and but as we know, in Armenian tradition, the groom's family comes and, and asks for the hand of, of, of the woman and of the bride. And so because her house is actually in Beirut, they decided to take her away from the school oh. that she was teaching in. <laughs> That's so, so sweet. It's, oh. a really, it's, a really, um, it's not just a cute story. It's like, it's the story that paints uh, teach for Armenia's impact yeah. fully because first it connected a diaspora to her homeland. Mm -hmm. Second, it enabled someone so brilliant like her to give so much to kids who need it, who need it the most. Third, it gave Afshal Luis uh, a, a new home and a new, and a new start and a new life. And in a very like primitive oh, so and strange. concrete way, it is, nation building because she is staying at on the border with her husband now they're going to be launching new initiatives there she's launching an educational center 
he's going to be going into like more of an agricultural farming business. Um, yeah. these, these people, a, they need to stay and they need to, they need to have their families there. And, and they, and, you know, and, and so many of them are leaving for very objective reasons, which none of us can, can say anything about because there's no work and kids are going hungry and parents need to make tough decisions. But teach for Armenia is, is one of the most concrete steps that we can enable to, to not just reverse that, but to, to start rebuilding it. Thousand percent. And the guy she met is from um, the town of Tabush. He's from there. So she lives in Nerkin Garmirakhur, which is the village in the region of Tabush. And the and the her husband is from there. So they got okay. married in the village. And they're, so he's you know, a local friends. Armenian. Yeah, local. Oh, from Armenia. <laughs> I love that and story so much. So um, how can the diaspora help teach for Armenia? Because I know many people who are watching right now are thinking, how can we help? What can I do? You know, and this can vary from a parent who has a child who's graduating from college, kind of like your mom, who can kind of nudge or make a suggestion. This could be uh, someone in college who's watching and who's thinking, how can I help? Or this can be someone in their you know, let's say 40s deep in their career thinking, how can I help? So how can the diaspora, you know, can you give us the different scenarios how they can help? Well, I mean, I think you laid out pretty much a, a lot of it. <laughs> so one yeah. is if you, if you're in that um, phase in your life where you want to do something today for Armenia's development, um, then, you know, really would encourage you to look into our two year uh, program at Teach for Armenia. If that's not something you can do, you can always like, you know, help us with our efforts by volunteering or contributing your in-kind uh, services to us. Maybe, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of young professionals who work in amazing companies who could maybe like take on to some pro bono work. Like we're always looking for support. I mean, we're a charity, so, and a nonprofit. So everything that we all resources we raise are through, you know, our own efforts and the efforts of the community. If you have, you know, an organization that you want to give to, then we are happy to talk to you about that too. We are constantly looking for sponsors who can help enable the necessary funds to um, help our, you know, our teacher leaders work. Uh, basically in these schools, we do provide um, our, 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 program participants make a salary from the school, but we also, since we require it for them to live in these villages, we give them a stipend every month to, to take care of housing and transportation. So if you're interested in like supporting that part of our work, you know, we're, we're, we'd be so grateful to, to talk to people about that. And we are, you know, really kind of trying to double down our efforts on diaspora recruitment because so far it's, it, it, it's been about 10% of our overall application pool. Mm -hmm. And we think the diaspora can just do so much more. Um, I know we're so used to going to the diaspora for fundraising, but we don't necessarily need to wait until we're in our 50s and have a little bit of spare cash to, to send to Armenia. We can actually get to work now. And Teach for Armenia is that opportunity, whether it's the two-year program or any of these other things that I listed. So I would really kind of like, encourage people to reach out to me, reach out to our team and figure out ways and how we can get, you know, diaspora communities just more kind of engaged and involved in the progress of the work uh, through their own time or sharing of resources or coming to Armenia, even if it's for a brief time uh, or helping us raise awareness in these communities. So there's a lot to do. I just don't want people to feel like it's either this or that. Like it's either you do the fellowship, the program or you don't do the program. No, like yeah. there's so much we can do and we just need to get to work. And um, I don't know why it's like the Armenian mom and me for some reason, I just have this question, but I'm thinking as an Armenian mother who's watching this and going, I would love to encourage my son or my daughter to participate, but is it safe? What do you say to those moms who are concerned about safety? Well, I mean, it's never easy for a parent to watch their child kind of grow up and 
go on an adventure like this. When we were just starting, we had a lot of conversations with concerned parents. Uh, back then, I mean, no one knew what, what Teach for Armenia was. We didn't have the track record that we have today. But I, I mean, I'm not a parent yet, so but I can just imagine how tough it is, especially for Armenian parents. You know, they kind of let their kids live in their houses for a really long time mm -hmm. as to you know, in like the typical American family, just I'm, you're out at age 18. Yeah. So but the child comes yeah. back with the, with benefits of how, like a change, like, my, you know, you're going to, your, your son or daughter is going to come back a changed man, a changed woman. What are the benefits as a parent? Yeah. So, I mean, like the, so the first question, is it safe? I mean, there, we, we send our fellows to work in communities where kids live and yes some of some most of our communities are on the border with Azerbaijan for example and there is kind of you know or in Atsa we have a huge uh, kind of presence in Atsa most of our fellows in Atsa are living in really really tough communities obviously right on the border so um so Yes, there is a sense that it's not necessarily the safest thing you can do, but we have children living in these communities and our, our program participants feel very much that if the kids can go through that, then they can go through that too. And it's tough for the parents to understand, but parents ultimately need to trust that their child is making the best decision for themselves. In terms of what I've heard parents tell, like the conversations I've had with parents after the two years are done. Mm -hmm their their children are more self-sufficient they're independent they're more resilient they have more grit they have a greater sense of possibility they're go-getters they believe that things can change and that they're not waiting for someone to come and do that for them that they just do it themselves and they've just seen immense like personal and professional growth within their children you know so far like i i I only have seen parents who have been very grateful, although in the beginning, it's obviously very understandably difficult. Love that. Thank you. So Larissa, during these live podcasts, um, I'm a firm believer and just like you are supporting Armenian businesses and, uh, and, and companies. And so what I like to do is I like to introduce the audience and our guest, uh, an Armenian owned company, uh, brand. And for, uh, this live, I found, uh, Zatik Natural. They're a, a natural skincare, um, skincare line and we actually have a connection <laughs> to this uh coincidentally so zatik natural is owned by an armenian husband and wife the husband is a scientist and the wife is the business brains behind it and the way i came across zatik is from a friend of mine from wisconsin and larissa is from wisconsin right larissa went to college there and my dad is from there yes <laughs> yes I just I just love the coincidence of it all but um it was really important for me to introduce Zatik Natural while Larissa was was our guest today um because I got to try the products for myself and it was a game changer so this isn't just it's Armenian owned I want you guys to buy and check it out no that's not the case I tried this oil for myself and I have rosacea do you have rosacea Larissa I do do as a as a half Irish woman I do <laughs> <laughs> there you go so uh, we need to get you the serum because this has been a game changer for me like it it, it worked like I it was really bad at some point right before Ofsana got me this oil and I'm already on my second bottle um, I, I kept the empty bottle for the purposes of our life and also summer's coming around I really encourage everyone to use natural um, mineral sunscreen and this is this has worked because I started playing tennis in the past couple of months and vigorously and I started I was like I'm gonna put this on my face and see if it works and it worked and my chest was all burnt because I forgot to put it on my chest but my face was totally fine so even though it's a mineral natural sunscreen it works and it's 
for it's good for the whole family. So again, support an Armenian owned brand. They're actually based out of Glendale, California too, which I love. And and when I reached out to them too, what I love about Armenians and the, the community that I'm building here with the Armenian report is they're giving twenty five percent off site wide. Like they're going extra for the for for the Armenian community and they're offering twenty five percent off site wide. So if you go to Nati ZatikNatural.com. I have the billboard here. You guys will see on the screen. You just take a screenshot and the, the promo code is TAR25. You get 25% off site wide. Um, so you can, you know, my mom loves the shampoo and conditioner. I'm swear by that oil and the sunscreen. I love that the sunscreen is natural. So again, support, try it out. Um, and I, I, I know you won't not like it because I'm so picky and the fact that it worked for me I just encourage everyone why not why not right Larissa we're already Absolutely. buying I can't products. wait to get myself some <laughs> exactly and it's just so much more it's just so much more meaningful when you can support an Armenian business and I can't wait to get my hands on on the SPF and the rosacea oil we're already buying sunscreen why not have it be natural and Armenian owned and you're getting the 25, like, it's just a win, 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 win for all. Um, so I'm, I'm just really pushing that hard. I want everyone to support Armenian owned brands. Um, do you think that you would have skipped certain hurdles launching uh, Teach for Armenia if you were a man launching this in Armenia? What I mean, you- it's no surprise. Armenia is a very traditional patriarchal Society. I mean, I think every everyone kind of has their own barriers that they need to go through. You know, when I came to Armenia, I I was like 23, I was from the diaspora, and I was a woman and am a woman still. <laughs> and uh, I'm much older now. But you know, I I think that there are some just like societal things that are kind of shocking at first, but then you get you don't get used to it. You just learn to not really take it. You know personally or or in a very emotional manner mm-hmm. you know for example small things like you're in a meeting and a man, a man shakes all the men's hands but then skips you over out of respect or, for you though right right That's their so mentality like, you know, exactly exactly yeah. and so you know i i really i really think there's no point of like getting so upset over it like if it bothers you then just tell that person you know, I would really appreciate it if you did shake my hand because when you don't, it makes me feel in this way. And usually even like the most traditional people who have just seen this and nothing else, they'll usually respond to it positively. And that's just okay. my experience. That's good. So I think there's a different mindset that you can have around being adaptable, being flexible, understanding like there's also advantages of, of being uh a young diasporan woman and, and doing, and doing the work that I'm doing. So I think like living in this space of like hurt and, and frustration and, you know, expectation that someone needs to understand, understand where you're coming from. Like, I just think that that's so American in, in, in the way that it's like, I'm the, I'm right. And, and everyone else is wrong. Like, Mm -hmm. I really think, there's something very colonial about that mentality. And so I, th- I think if, if you can respect the country that you live in and the, the no- norms that they have and, and try to work with people to understand why, you know, things can get better or can move in a different direction and really always try to figure out how to balance all of that. I think that, that we'll just do so much more together right now there's like a clash. It's like, I, I think I'm right. You are wrong. And the other side thinks you are wrong. And like, you're just not going anywhere and you end up hating each other. So to me, that's just been my, my tactic. And, and yeah, there are some days when it gets to be super annoying, but you just have to just have to talk about it openly. Do you have a message for women who are inspired to start a business in Armenia or with Armenians? Like, what's your message to women specifically in that situation? Who uh, they're inspired, but they're they're almost holding back because they're like, "Well, I'm a woman." Yeah, I mean, you know, I was I was raised in a family that, like, my mom and dad always said, "You can do whatever you put your mind to." Yeah, and. 
and I really believe that. And, and yeah, maybe if you grew up in a different kind of environment where you're expected to do things and expected and not expected to do other things like Mm -hmm. that can really sit with you. The one thing I tell all of the women and the girls that I work with or, you know, interact with is if you want to do something, just do it right. Like just, don't think about, well, if I was a woman and if I was a man and if I was younger, if I was older, if I spoke Eastern Armenian versus Western Armenian, just like there will always be a reason why something shouldn't be done. But if you really want to do it, you, sh- you should just go for it and adapt yeah. throughout the process. Absolutely. thousand percent. Uh, what's the best business advice you've ever received? Um, well, one, I really believe that if you want something to work, you need to give it a hundred percent. When I was just starting Teach for Armenia, uh, I was like working side jobs. I had to make ends meet. I had some money saved up. And one of the potential donors I was pursuing for funding um, to help us start asked me, how much time are you spending on this? And I said, well, you know, about 50% because I have this and this and all these other things. And he said, well, if you want me to give 100% of my commitment to you, like, for funding, then Mm -hmm. I need to know that you're in this 100% yourself. I think that's really important. I think you need to become extremely obsessed and, like, live and breathe your idea. That's um, what I'm doing. 100%. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. And people are going to tell you that you're an idiot and it's never going to work. And and you just need to... Yeah. you just, you cannot live into that BS because mm-hmm. you're just not going to get to where you need to go. Yeah. Um, another, another piece of advice that I received and I really love that comes from uh, Brene Brown, for those who know her, like, you know, she's like, I really only want to get feedback from people who are getting their ass, asses kicked in the arena of work every single day. And, and I really come to understand that like my biggest mentors and seek out mentors, right? And so the biggest mentors that I have had in my life are people who have just gotten their ass kicked over and over and over and over again because they're like working towards something big. <laughs> and the third thing I'll say is... And usually um, those are the ones who don't give advice because they're too busy getting like trying to get up. And the ones who are, you know, have their cushy, you know, corporate job, they're just like so many opinions and ideas that they've got and I'm just like no 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 not you I need it from the one who's down (laughs) I need the one who's in the arena (laughs) right people who are that busy they just don't have time so you need to seek them out and you need to tell them like I need five minutes of your time I need to run something for by you for 10 minutes the third thing is a, a very wise woman said this to me even on the days when you're absolutely exhausted, you have no energy, everything is working against you, just show up. Even if you look like crap, even if you can't like process 70% of the information that's coming at you, just be there and, and just show up to whatever it is that you're doing in yeah. whatever capacity you can. And I, I think that that's just been like a best. very important kind of mindset for me. That, that I had that day when we lost this live and it was 9 p.m. and I had exhausted everyone and everything. And at like 10 p.m. I was just like, I'm done. I have no one else to call at this point. It's like 10, p- 10 p.m. I'm, I'm, I'm t- but, but up until then, I was like, no, no. But we got this. We're, we're gonna we're gonna save this. This is fine. And no, I showed up, but it didn't show up for me. <laughs> and that's okay. That's okay. So, that's, just, that's just part of the yeah. process. <laughs> and um, last question that I ask uh, all of our guests is: um, When the Armenian genocide gets the worldwide recognition that it deserves, um, what do you? foresee the future looking like for us with that worldwide recognition oh wow that's a that's a heavy last note um, <laughs> the reason why i like to ask this question um for i'm saying it for you and for people watching is because i want us as a community to uh begin to envision what that's like so we can live that it's a tough it's a tough question because it seems like Turkey 
the you know the current Turkish government is just is just regressing further and further and further away from acknowledging at this point acknowledging that Armenians live there in the first place. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, let alone acknowledging what happened um, in 1915. So, uh, you know, I. I I also see a different side to it. I see uh, a growing movement of Turkish intellectuals who at the risk of their own lives are talking openly about what happened and, and they want their government to recognize and to really kind of begin living through a very, very long-term acknowledging recognition and healing process. Look at Germany. I mean, in an ideal world, I think it's someday Turkey will understand that if they are to become a great nation, that they would follow Germany's example. Um, and it would mean reparations. It would mean billions of dollars paid to, you know, to Armenia and to the Armenian people. It would impact the way we teach history. It would impact the way we teach uh, human genocide and trauma. I wouldn't need to tell my friends from whichever country who know about the Holocaust but have no idea about the Armenian genocide that actually it is it is the Armenian genocide that was the first, you know, genocide of, of our modern times and that un, unless we not just acknowledge it for our Armenia's sake or, or the sake of Armenians, but we as humanity need to acknowledge it and we need to keep accountability and, and enforce accountability measures upon perpetrators. Uh, if we don't do that, then genocide is going to continue to happen as we see today. As we see, yeah. So, yeah, so as an Armenian, you know, it's it's really obviously emotional and difficult to, to think about what this means for us and, and to live, to really live genetically as part of our DNA with this trauma. Uh, but on the other hand, like I, I do think of myself as like, you know, someone who's just had the opportunity to see so much and to travel to so many places. We're just all so similar and we're so human. And that if we can't figure this out um, and can enforce accountability towards governments and then, you know, it's just going to happen over and over again in different parts of the world. And it's just, it's so sad to, to think that that's something that can continue happening. Well, I don't want to end on a sad note. <laughs> so quick, say something happy. <laughs> but um, I love what you said. And uh, everything you said is true. It, it, it's uh, the, the, the healing process to... Oh. Did, you, did you give up on me? Hi. Okay. <laughs> And I want us to all start thinking about what that's going to be like so that we begin to think like that versus denial. Um, with that said, thank you so much, Larissa, for doing this with us uh, again. Um, and I'm so, I just can't wait for everyone to watch, watch you and your story and um, join Teach for Armenia, however way they can. Larissa is on Instagram, so be sure to follow her. I will include her uh, link right here below us, at Larissa Hovanesian, and of course, Teach for Armenia handle. They're, you, you're on Instagram and, face, uh, and Instagram and Facebook. Are you on Twitter as well? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so both. they're all over social media. Be sure to check it out. They're always sharing really inspiring stories on Teach for Armenia, and I'll be sure to share one of them before we we air this live. So you'll 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 see the story then. Um, I think his name was Hike, the the blind teacher, Larissa. Yeah, I love I'm, yeah. his story. <laughs> so these are the types of stories that you see and you're inspired when you follow Teach for Armenia and you stay up to date, direct stories about children and the teachers from the diaspora and in Armenia from all over the world who go and, and commit their time and their life to working for, uh, for Teach for Armenia. So again, thank you so much, Larissa. And um, I will be in touch with you. Thank, thank you, you so Anna. Much. Thank you to everyone who watched this today. All right. Be in touch. <laughs> All right. We'll do. Take care. Bye, Larissa. Bye. Whoa, 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 whoa.
don't turn it off. We're not done here. I'm not done with you guys. I'm not done with you because we have our third brand partner, Droipal, and I want to tell you guys all about Droipal. Droipal is an LA-based internet marketing agency, and its partner is is Adis, who is Armenian, and he is a lifelong supporter of Armenian causes, including the Armenian Report. So what Droipal does is they help you with your business when it comes to internet marketing. And for example, SEO, which is so crucial for any business, right? If you have a business, you want to be online and you need SEO. You call Adis for a free consultation, and if you choose to take a CO or whatever service you choose to take that is going to benefit your business based off your free consultation, you will get 10% off whatever service you choose to take. So what you want to do is you want to go to droipal.com backslash the Armenian report. And I have it here linked on, on the banner as well. I'll take a screenshot right now. Fill out the form. Audis will give you a call and you will and he will help you figure out how to grow your business, how to take your business to the next level. Whatever it is, he's there to help you. He's Armenian really nice, really smart guy. Trust me, every business needs this. Stop wasting time, stop wasting money and and uh, on poor marketing strategies that are just wasting money. So give him a call and it's a free consultation. You don't have to get anything. Just un let him explain to you uh, explain your business and let him explain to you what you need to how he can help you get you to the next level. Me, as someone who runs their business online, this is so important. Thank you again to Larissa Hovanesian and the entire team at Teach for Armenia for the amazing work that they're doing back home. Special thanks to our brand partners for making this available to all of us Henry's House of Coffee, Zatik Natural, and Droipal. Be sure to check them out. I can't emphasize enough. Support Armenian-owned businesses. Big thanks to everyone watching and supporting. Please, please don't forget to leave a comment. Make sure you leave a comment. Whatever it is. You don't have anything to say. You liked it. Put a heart. You, you have a question. Write it down. Leave it in the comments. Leave comments, please. Comments are really, really, really important in growing the community and this live platform. Thank you again. And of course. The Armenian Report is not only just these lives. Every single day you will get news about Armenia, from Armenia, around Armenians, anything Armenia related in English, uh, and all our content goes into Facebook stories and Instagram stories. So just every day, pop in and check it out. And if you do miss it, they all go into the highlights folder. Follow the Armenian Report on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and YouTube. Thank you again for watching so much, and I can't wait to see you in the next one. Bye.